I heard the story of a pastor who invited a guest preacher to his church one Sunday, and they had the normal service, and the pastor introduced this guest speaker, and he preached, and then afterwards they were shaking people out of the church. The guest minister said, I noticed something. When people came by me, I shook their hand, and when they came by you, pastor, you held their hand. And I want to thank you for letting me not just shake your hands these last three months, but for some of you, for me to be able to hold your hand. I'm just an interim preacher. I got a job at the college. I'm just a teacher. But you have honored me with your um, kindnesses and your encouragement and the firm hand grasp back, and you've blessed me. I... um, have watched you during this interim. Some of you have gone through some hard times. And some of you have gone through some very joyful times. We've mourned the loss of some and we have welcomed the new life of others, celebrated these new arrivals. For some of you, it has been winter time in your faith and it's been hard for you to take steps of faith. But I appreciate your willingness to obey the voice of God who speaks so beautifully to you. And for others, it has been the springtime of your faith, and you've boldly taken steps and trusted God. For some, you've been on a mountaintop experience, and for others, you've been in the valley, even some the valley of the shadow of death. But I do appreciate the fact that you have tolerated me and have let me be a part of your life And as I think of the many churches that I have the privilege of serving, and even those in the future, I will always think kindly of Lawrence, even more so now than just that this little university is up the road a bit, but there's this outstanding church here. So thank you. I was standing in front of a young couple preparing to marry them at Shawnee Mission Park, a park just a little bit west of Olathe. I had come to know the couple because his mother was in our Sunday school class, and she asked me one day, do you marry people? And I said, I do. And she goes, my son's getting married. Will you marry him? And I said, well, normally the bride and groom get to pick. (laughs) Mother. (laughs) Just saying. But I would be glad to visit with him if you want to give him my contact information. She did, and a few weeks later, we were meeting in my office talking about their lives and uh, what they wanted to do with their wedding, and we had agreed that if it was okay with them and if it was okay with me, then we would decide to get married and I would perform the ceremony for them. And so that was worked out, and so now I'm standing in front of them at this park, waiting for the bride to come down from the little picnic shelter. It was an outdoor wedding. He's standing here with his best man, and family's all here, about 25 or 30 people. She walked in to oohs and ahs, and we had a prayer. I did the greetings. I gave a short homily. We passed the rings. I did their vows. I said, you can kiss your bride now, Kenny, and he did. And I said, before I introduce you to the congregation, I'd like to bless you. And so I gave him this blessing. You know, in a situation like that, there are a number of blessings that come to mind, and I had a few in my mind I thought I would pick. I thought about the blessing, may your troubles be as far and few between as your grandmother's teeth. (laughs) But, you know, maybe not here. I thought, as you slide down the banister of life, may the splinters never point in the wrong direction. I thought of this blessing, may those who love us love us, and those that do not, may God change their hearts. And if he cannot change their hearts, may he twist their ankles so we can recognize them by their limping. (laughs) But I wanted to bless the couple. I needed to remind myself and maybe them that most of us sometimes think of a blessing as something that comes just prior to eating a meal, but it is surely much more than that. A blessing contributes to our well-being, to our happiness, to our success, to our own spiritual life. 
and I stood in front of this couple and wanted to bless them. And I was hoping when they heard the blessing that they would not think it is an entitlement. Welfare it is not. Two things are required of any blessing, and that is obedience to God and work. The psalmist said, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Emphasis on the word walk and the word labor. <coughs> Blessings mentioned more times in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. In fact, we can find the word blessing over 60 times. And so we come to this point in the ceremony, and I wanted to bless them. It was all done, and I said to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And then I said, may you so live in this life that in the life to come you will have everlasting life. And they turned, and I introduced them, and they walked down the aisle off to their life. They had known each other before the wedding. They had lived together for about five years and decided now it was the time to make it legal. I guess he was going to make her legal and she him. And so when I blessed them, it was really a blessing that I hope they would just hear, not the blessing that let's get back to the uh, gift table and see what kind of prizes we got at our wedding. The blessing I pick comes from Numbers chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to that portion of Scripture. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, the fourth book of the Old Testament and the sixth chapter. Aaron and his sons were instructed by Moses to bless the children of Israel. It was a divine blessing and it was a divine keeping. And the power of the blessing has been connected with the purpose of God. We are blessed when we are faithful and when we are obedient. Now, now this blessing was not an undeserved free gift. It's not like, I hope I get blessed and win the lottery. It's not that. They were blessed only in the name of the Lord, and they were blessed if obedient. The Israelites had just left Egypt. It had just been a few weeks. They were on a direct, straight line to the promised land. They had not yet turned right to the desert wanderings those 40 years. And Moses was in the process of getting them all organized where everyone was a slave when they left, and now he has to begin to put them in categories. And so they did a census to see who people were, and they began to put the organizational structure into place. And then we find these beautiful words in Numbers 6, starting at the 22nd chapter, it's the 22nd verse, and I would ask you to stand for God's word this morning. This is the word of the Lord, Number 6. Verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Pray with me. Help us, Lord, in this service this morning. As we focus our attention on your blessings and what we are to do as we receive these blessings, help me while I preach this morning, Lord, especially this morning, open our hearts, open our minds to what you would have to say to us. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. We turn to Webster's treasury of synonyms, antonyms, and homonyms and find a number of words that are synonymous with the Lord bless you. We find words like enrich, cheer, thank, gladden, rejoice. The word that I have picked for us this morning is endow. The Lord endow you. We read in Genesis 12 of the calling of Abraham. God speaks to Abraham and he says, leave your country and go. Go to the place that I will show you. And then God said to Abraham, I will bless you and make you famous, and I will make you a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. All the families of the earth will be blessed by you. 
And here's what Abraham did. We know him as this great man of faith. Can I tell you, he was just a youngster in the faith when God spoke to him on this day. He was 75 years of age. But he took his first step of faith and he did what God told him to do. And he departed his first steps of faith. I believe that a benefactor engraves his name in the hand that receives the benefit. God has engraved his name on our hands so we will always remember the benefit that he has given to us. I was serving in a church and we did a community campaign. We went out and knocked on doors and invited people to a special service. And so my friend and I were out walking around and we went up to this house. I saw the sign in the yard that said, Palms Red Here. And I thought even a palm reader needs to be invited to church and hear the special service. And so I walked up and knocked on the door. And when she opened the door, I stuck out my hand to shake her hand. She grabbed my hand and said hi. And she took my hand and turned it over and held my wrist. And she opened up my palm and she said, let me just read your palm. It was an accidental palm reading. (laughs) I wondered, was she going to charge me? She said, this is your dominant hand. It will tell you about your work life and how you present yourself to the world. Oh, I see your headline is very long and curved. It, it means you're a creative thinker. And I see your heart line is long and straight. It means you are a very rational thinker. I, I, I thought in that moment I was going to get hit by lightning. I'm just telling you. And the person who was with me kind of took a couple steps back. And I felt like saying, well, while you're looking, do you see the name of God? Do you see the name of Jesus or the Holy Spirit etched upon my hand? Look, look closely. Do you see my parents' name, Jim and Dorothy? Do you see their names there? Do you see the names of all the churches I attended as a kid and all the pastors' names and all the youth pastors' names? Do you see, their, do you see the names of... Robert and Beverly, it, it, there may not be a last name there, but Robert and Beverly, they're just like grandparents. Do you, do you see their names in my hand? The benefactor carves in our hands to remind us these blessings. And so I ask you today, look at your hands. Forget the headline and the heart line. Look for the names of people that have etched their names on your hands to always remember you. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow said, The charities that soothe and heal and bless lie scattered at the feet of people like flowers. In a few moments, we'll be dismissed and we'll be discharged to go back to the other world. Before you take that first step, look around you at the floor of all the flowers that are there, the flowers of people in your past that have graced you with their lives, their input, these parents, your pastors, all the churches, all those gospel preachers and singing, all those Bible studies you've heard are like blessings to you. You can't look long at your hands and not see God's blessings, and you can't take very many steps before you step on the pedals of God's grace to you. Look at your feet, folks, as you step out of the sanctuary today. We know in the Old Testament often blessings were tied to material possessions. If you have your Bibles, flip over to the next book, which is Deuteronomy, and go to the seventh chapter of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 7, I'll begin reading at verse 11. Therefore, take care to follow the commands, decrees, and laws I give you today. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your forefathers. He will love you and bless you and increase your numbers. He will bless the fruit of your womb, the crops of your land, your grain, new wine, and oil, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks in the land that he swore to your forefathers to give you. You'll be blessed more than any other people. None of your men or women will be childless, nor any of them with livestock without young. Material blessings 
the Lord bless you. I looked at this young couple and I said, the Lord bless you. I, I was saying, the Lord endow you. But there was more than just, I hope you get good stuff. And we have to be careful, folks, about this thing called prosperity religion. That the reason I serve Christ is to get, the reason I pay my tenth is to get more, the reason I do these things is to get into heaven, the, the reason I do this, I look over my shoulder waiting for the blessings. When we talk about blessings, we are not talking about material possessions. God will keep his promise of unfailing love to you. Skip ahead to chapter 28 of the same chapter in Deuteronomy. Beginning at the first verse, listen to the word of the Lord, Deuteronomy 28. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all the commands I give you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and eating trough will be blessed. You'll be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you as one, but scatter from you in seven directions. The Lord will send a blessing on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. Verse 9, the Lord will establish you as his holy people as he promised you on oath. If you keep his commands of the Lord your God and walk in his ways, then all the peoples on earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will fear you. The Lord will grant you abundant prosperity in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your ground, in the land he swore to your forefathers to give you. The Lord will open the heavens and storehouses of his bounty to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations and borrow from none. The Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never at the bottom. Do not turn aside from any of the commands I give you today to the right or to the left, following other gods and serving after them. Look close at these trigger phrases, fully obey, carefully follow, keep the commands, walk in his ways, pay attention to the commands, carefully follow them, do not turn aside from any of these commands. When I stood there in front of that young couple and I said, may the Lord bless you, I was saying more than just, I hope you get a lot of good stuff in life. And when I say to you today, the Lord bless you, I hope you understand what I'm saying the Lord endow you, and he will with your faithfulness. You're a good-looking crowd. You're a well-dressed crowd. You're a well-spoken crowd and a well-driven crowd. I saw your cars when I pulled in the parking lot. You're a well-housed crowd. You're a well-bejeweled crowd. You're a well-endowed crowd. Thanks be to God. When my wife and family moved into our home there in Olathe, the real estate agent said, now there's a homeowners association that's tied to where you live here, this little community called Dallington. I said, okay, that's fine. And he said, and after you get into the house, probably the welcome committee will come by and say welcome. They might bring you some gifts, some cookies or something, and then they're going to give you a document, which is the covenants of all the people in this area that we've all agreed to, and you'll have to abide by those covenants. He said, don't be surprised if they say something about your trash cans when they want you to take them out and how quickly you want them to come back. They may say something about your leaf bags and when they're supposed to go out for the, for, for the trash pickup. Don't be surprised if they say something about not parking on the street but putting your cars up in the driveway or even better, inside the garage. Don't be surprised if you go to build a fence, you'll have to get approval. It can't be more than five feet, and it can only be one of these three types. He said, don't be surprised with some of these covenants that will come to you. And don't be surprised if you want to put a shed in your back property. They won't let you do that because they want the property to look good for everyone in the neighborhood. They want to protect the investment. Do you understand? I said, I understand. Wow. I thought I was just buying a house for crying out loud. We'd lived there a couple of years, and one day I received a note in an envelope in the mail, and it was from the Homeowners Association 
They said, we take great pride in our property and all of our homes, and we would like to thank you in advance for painting your house this summer. <laughs> and you can check with this person to have your paint color approved. Thank you very much. Now, I have a little carnality in me, even as a sanctified saint. You, I think you guys know that. And so I took a swatch of about 15 colors, and I knocked on that person's door. And when the woman answered, I said, I'm looking for the paint police. <laughs> and I fanned out all of those colors, and I said, this is the palette I'm looking for. Could you tell me some that would be approved, and I'll tell you if that's the one I have picked. And she goes, oh, it's not that big a deal. And I said, well, I have picked this one. Is this one okay? And she said, yes, it is. So later at the end of that summer into fall, I had the house painted, and I sent them a note back, and it just said, you're welcome. <laughs> you see, I wanted to live there. I wanted the benefits of all the property values that have been rising year after year after year. Thank you very much. But I have responsibilities, too. There's a covenant to be blessed to live in this neighborhood and have the property values increase, I've got to do my part as well. And when I looked at this young couple and said, the Lord bless you, I hope they were hearing more than just we get free stuff without being obedient to God. I've spoken to my grandmother a few times from this pulpit. At 15, she was married. At 27, she accepted Christ. Someone knocked on her door and said, there's a holiness group that's holding... Um, religious services on the outskirts of town, a big tent meeting, do you want to go? My grandmother, Vanita Beth, had really had a hunger for God even before she was a Christian. And she went and accepted Christ at the end of that campaign of meetings for two weeks long. Those, those meetings took place. It changed her life. It changed the life of her family. It set our entire family on a different trajectory altogether. And I will never, ever be able to thank God enough for this woman that knocked on the door and invited my grandmother to church. I was talking one day to my father because our family has really been blessed with longevity. My grandfather died just shy of his 104th birthday. Mima at 90. I talked to my father this morning before I came to church. He's 92. He has a brother who's 96. They'll have lunch together. Another uncle died in a car accident at the age of 93. And the youngest uncle died at the age of 89. And, and in all of these years, through all of our family, death has not knocked on our door very many times. And we've really been a blessed family. And I asked Dad one day, I said, Dad, I know there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about the blessings falling from the, the, the children and then to the children's children. And Dad said, oh, yeah, Psalm 103, verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness is with their children's children. I said, that's the verse. I said, do you think we have been so blessed because of Mima's commitment to God and God's favor is coming from generation to generation to generation? And he said, hold on just a minute. You didn't read the second verse. In fact, if you look at the punctuation, there's not a period after verse 17. There's a dash, which means something else is coming. Go get the Bible. I did. I opened up, and here's what verse 18 says. With those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. One of the reasons we've been blessed is not because of what Mima did graciously say by God, but because we have accepted, we've We've confessed our sins, he's forgiven us our sins, and we've tried our best to obey his precepts. The Lord bless you, and what I'm really saying is be obedient, be faithful. Don't look for stuff, look for him. Be faithful and obedient. Jim Simbola, in his book, Breakthrough Prayer, writes, the day of obedience became the day of blessings, the moment when God manifested again his bountiful provision for his people. Barrenness was replaced by fruitfulness because the people yielded to God's call on their lives. My major professor at Southern Nazarene University, Tom Barnard, knows I was going to be here today, and he sent me this little note knowing what I was going to be preaching. He said, Mark, remember this, blessings are seldom used to define wealth or financial gain. And I want to be careful here when I talk about blessings. 
he, he's reminding me, I'm reminding all of us. They're not promises of enormous unearned windfalls. Instead, they are the byproduct of knowing God and following his precepts. And so I stood in front of this couple and I said, the Lord bless you. And I hoped he would. I knew he would, especially if they were faithful to his precepts and his commands. But I also said to the young couple, as I say to you, the Lord keep you. Again, back to Webster's, we find these words synonymous with keep. Hold, preserve, support, maintain, sustain, tend. But the word that I'm going to pull out for us this morning is safeguard. The Lord keep you. The Lord safeguard you. It is a divine keeping, a divine safeguarding to break the hold of the workers of iniquity. When God told Moses to tell Aaron to bless the people, it was not just for blessings, it was for them to obey, but it was also to break the hold of the workers of iniquity. Listen to these beautiful God-keeping, God-safeguarding verses. To Jacob, God said, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Listen to what David prays. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Protect me from men of violence who plan to trip my feet. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the doors of my lips. And here's God's answer in Psalms to David. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. In Proverbs, we read this beautiful verse. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. Isaiah, in that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, will watch over it. I will water it continually. I guard it day and night so no one may harm it. I, the Lord, have called you to righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you be a covenant for my, my people and a light for the Gentiles. And to the church at Philippi, Paul writes, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. And to young Timothy, Paul wrote, this is why I'm suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and I'm convinced that he is able to guard which I have entrusted to him for that day. And in Jude, this beautiful doxology, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and without great joy. The Lord keep you. I stood in front of that young couple and I said, the Lord bless you. And I hoped he would and I hoped they would be obedient. And I said in the Lord, safeguard you. The Lord keep you. And I'll say to you today too, the Lord safeguard you from the workers of iniquity. Each culture, each generation has its own pop musical divas. For some in our country, that person was Ella Fitzgerald or maybe Barbara Streisand, or for you it might have been Christina Aguilera, maybe Beyonce or even Justin Bieber. That was a joke. To see if you were listening. <laughs> maybe you were thinking about your own pop diva. And maybe it was Justin Bieber. <laughs> but one of those is Mahalia Jackson. And some of you older folks may know her and her music. Her mother died when she was five. And her father sent her off to live with her aunt Mahalia Duke Paul. Now, her aunt had a ban on secular music, and so Mahalia said she had to slip in and slide in and sneak in those Ida Cox and Ma Ramey and Enrico Caruso records to get her secular music fix. At the age of 16, she joined the Greater Salem Choir in Chicago, and during the 40s and the 50s, her beautiful contralto voice was celebrated worldwide. She was heard on most radio shows appeared on most television programs and sang in many performance halls. 
1957, she was invited to the Newport Jazz Festival, and they said, we want you to do a blues concert for us. And she kicked back, and she said, I think I'd like to do an all-gospel concert. And they yielded to her. She said, blues songs are songs of despair. Gospel songs are songs of hope. You're delivered from your burdens. In the 60s, she was a civil rights movement worker. When Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, he shared the platform and sang a beautiful old slave spiritual. And five years later at his funeral, she sang the beautiful song, Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me to the promised land. I, I, I never heard her sing in person. I'm familiar with her records and her music. She died in 1972 when I was a junior in college, so I never saw her live. But I do know that the last 25 years of her life, she was one of the keynote singers for Billy Graham and his Worldwide Crusades. And the song that was most requested and the song she enjoyed singing the most and the audiences wanted her to sing was a song entitled, His Eye is on the Sparrow. I looked at this young couple that day and I said, the Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. And I had in mind, as God watches the sparrows, he'll watch this young couple. Mahalia sings these beautiful songs, these words. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Here's a beautiful little chorus. I don't know if you know the chorus. If you know the chorus, sing it with me, will, will you please? I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. You're well voiced too. It was Jesus who said to his followers, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from their, the will of your heavenly Father? And even the very hairs of your head are numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows are. And in his last, one of his last, very last recorded prayers found in John 17, Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Disciples are just a ways off sleeping. Jesus prays to his father about his situation. Then he prays for those disciples close by. And then he prays for all of us this beautiful prayer. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord endow you and the Lord safeguard you. Let me close with this illustration. For the last 16 years of his life, Reverend Jeremiah Rankin pastored the first congregational church in Washington, D.C., he knew that his final Sunday was coming, and he wanted to write a poem to give to the people. And so he did that, and then he sent it to two friends to see if they could set it to music, this poem. One of those was a gentleman by the name of William Tomer, who got to work right away and sent back this little musical note to him. He liked it. And so on his final Sunday, this poem set to music was sung for the congregation. They all sang it together. Shortly after, others began to hear about it and liked it and began to sing it, and there were requests for it. And shortly after that, Dwight L. Moody, the great evangelist in America, heard about it and then adopted it for his crusades. And soon, assemblies of thousands worldwide sang this joyful song. 
really only heaven knows how many times this song has been sung in parting of friends that would never meet again on this earth. But no happier farewell could be spoken by Christians than the simple wish, God be with you till we meet again. As he thought of saying goodbye to people that he loved, as he put pen to paper and wrote these words, listen to what he writes. By his counsels, guide, uphold you. With his sheep, securely fold you. Neath his wings, protecting, hide you. Daily manna, still provide you. God be with you till we meet again. When life's perils thick confound you, put his arms unfailing round you. Keep love's banner floating o'er you. Smite death's threatening wave before you. God be with you till we meet again. And the beautiful chorus, till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. God be with you till we meet again. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. God bless you. Uh, I'm going to keep you here for just uh, another minute. Uh, the first week in November, I sat right here in this very spot and I was asked to come and meet um, this guy I didn't know anything about. And he was going to come and he was going to preach every Sunday and uh, he was going to uh, uh, bring the word to us. And man, I was, uh, I was skeptical uh, because, you know, we're going through a transition and, and Pastor Bob was leaving uh, that next Sunday or, or maybe he had already left. And uh, the comfort that I felt as Mark stood right here in this spot and kind of laid out shared a little bit about himself and, and what his plan was for our church. I knew that we were in great hands. And what were we these last months? Um, from Advent to the faces of God today, uh, from ob object of his wrath and objects of his mercy, uh, you spoke to us, and we appreciate you. Would you come up? Uh, sorry, that was a, this makes me feel better. <laughs> Just genetics. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Mom. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you've had a chance to drop a card for Mark uh, in, in the, the foyer. If not, please give it to him after he leaves. Uh, but we did want to show our appreciation to you. We've been uh, paying you a small amount of money each week, I think, Carl. Yeah. Um, and this is a small token of our appreciation, but uh, today uh, we want to show, uh, or we want you to feel like you're an object of our appreciation and love, uh, because we do appreciate you very much. Uh, even though in our books there'll be a little asterisk next to your name, you know, for payroll or, or whatever, but in the ledger of First Church of the Nazarene, you'll be one of our pastors. And we appreciate you very much. So let's give a hand for Pastor Mark. Yeah. thousand thank yous and for me when I get to heaven I want to see all the big shots I want to see my family and it'll be so fun to sit down and hear each person's story sinners say by grace thanks be to God and I look forward then to hearing all of your stories in great detail because you've heard plenty of mine thank you Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Mark's, Mark's job is not done. He's probably going to go maybe take a week off or something, but you'll probably <laughs> hit another church here soon. 
uh, this is what he does yeah. every week. Uh, we want to send you off with a short prayer. I've asked Darren Goodwin to come and, and pray for you. Uh, we'll pray, and then you are dismissed uh, uh, today. So thank you, Darren. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's yeah. a little bittersweet to uh, pray for you in this way because we know that that means next week you won't be here. Right. But we just wanted to say publicly something I know people have shared with you privately You've had a tremendous impact here. Thanks. And we're reminded of God's timing and how he's brought you along for this time. So join me in just praying for Dr. Mark in this time. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for your servant. We're so thankful for your timing and how you brought him here just when we needed to hear through him what you had to say to us. I'll never think about the way that you think about me mm -hmm. in the same way again. Thank the Lord. And we just pray a blessing on him. We just pray that in these days and weeks and months ahead, whatever adventure comes his way, whether it's on campus at MNU, whether it's uh, pastoring another church part-time, whether it's maybe uh, finding another broken-down piece of furniture on the side of the road, <laughs> whatever it is, God, we just pray a blessing on him, his family, his ministry, his job at the school. Thank you for uh, the servant of God coming and being a blessing, and most of all, for you speaking through him deeply into our lives. We're forever grateful. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. God bless you.